right now I'm going to, um, I have the immense honor of moderating a panel discussion with some pretty amazing women who would be amazing even if the title of the panel did not have Asian American <laughs> in it. They're amazing on their own. Um, uh, this is a panel that we wanted to do during Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month, um, but due to conflicts, we just couldn't make it happen. And I'm, I'm really glad that NPCA had, um, you know, had, has agreed to, you know, bring it in and make this the keynote discussion for the evening. Um, it's really important because Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders are currently the fastest growing racial and ethnic um, group in the United States, That's right? So, but the story didn't, is not, this is not a recent story, right? So this is a story that dates back decades of Asian Americans contributing to American communities throughout the nation. And it's often a story that's overlooked. And so I'm, I'm so glad that we get to have this discussion because representation matters. And I want to, you know, we want to discuss, you know, why it's important to have Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in leadership positions in communities representing. Um, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in the Philippines, and I happen to be Filipino American. And I often tell the story of how in during my service, people would say, oh, well, like, you know, we didn't get a real American. And I used to think I'm from Detroit, which is the most American <laughs> place ever, you know, we make cars. And so um, I'm joined by three women who are very much American. And um, I have their very impressive bios here. The first person I have on the panel is US Congresswoman Grace Meng, who is serving her third term in the US House of Representatives. She represents the sixth congressional district of New York, encompassing the New York borough of Queens, including West Central and Northeast Queens. Congresswoman Meng is the first Asian American member of Congress from New York State and the only Congress member of Asian descent in the entire Northeast. Congresswoman Meng is a member of the powerful House Appropriations Committee and its subcommittees on state and foreign operations and commerce, justice, science, and related agencies. Congresswoman Meg has passed several pieces of legislation. I, I promise you, look it up, um, including <laughs> striking Oriental, the term Oriental from federal law. She was born in Elmhurst, Queens and raised in the Bayside and Flushing sections of borough. Congresswoman Meng, thank you so much for joining us. Um, next up, I'm going to introduce Ambassador Julia Chang Black. Um, she's the first Asian American to hold such rank in US history. She has had an extensive career in international affairs and government service beginning in 1964 as a Peace Corps volunteer in Malaysia and culminating as US ambassador to the Kingdom of Nepal. And in between, she worked for several years at USAID. Um, after 25 years in government service, Ambassador Block moved over to the corporate sector and in 1993 became Group Executive Vice President at the Bank of America. Um, ambassador Block then moved into philanthropy, serving as president and CEO of the United States Japan Foundation, a private grant making institution with $100 million in assets. Beginning in 1998, Ambassador Block shifted her focus to China, first becoming visiting professor at the Institute of International Relations and executive vice chairman of the American Study Center at Peking University, and subsequently, affiliating with Fudan University in Shanghai, as well as the University of Maryland as ambassador in residence at the Institute for Global Chinese Affair. And rounding out this panel discussion is Secretary Elaine Chow, um, who has been appointed to two, <laughs> two presidential cabinet positions, US Secretary of Transportation and US Secretary of Labor. So when she was unanimously confirmed to her first cabinet position as Secretary of Labor, she became the first woman of Asian American and Pacific Islander heritage to serve in the president's cabinet. When she was at the U.S. Department of Labor, Secretary Chow launched the annual Asian Pacific American Federal Career Advancement Summit and the annual Opportunity Conference. During her tenure, the department's Bureau of Labor Statistics began reporting the employment data on Asians in America as a distinct category, which was a historic first. 
To help the Asian American community, she ensured that labor law materials were translated into multiple languages, including Chinese, Vietnamese, and Korean. Secretary Chow also is a past director of the Peace Corps. Uh, she established the first programs in the Baltic nations and the newly, newly independent states of the former Soviet Union. She was an immigrant when she arrived to the U.S. at the age of eight, speaking no English, and she received her citizenship at the age of 19. Truly impressive. Thank you so much, ladies, for joining me in this discussion. I, I wanted to start off by asking you kind of, and, and, and maybe Ambassador Black, if you want to go first, um, when I told my story about people at my site at Peace Corps saying, oh, like, you know, we didn't get a real American. I'm curious to know um, if, if you've ever encountered this in your international work. And, and, and if you could talk a little bit about why it's important to have Asian Americans in, 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 in international development, you know, in other fields. And, and I'm going to ask this question of everybody. But then also, what challenges did, did you face? I'm happy to begin. I have a variation of your story. I'll start with the Peace Corps because that goes way back. Um, I was uh, sent to the middle of the jungle in Borneo, in Sabah, Malaysia. And I was a teacher at a Chinese middle school. Um, and that middle school had been a prisoner of war uh, camp um, during the World War II. So the first day I arrived on campus, there was a hush in the audience. And I was looking around thinking, what's going on here? Then I heard in Chinese, uh, I don't speak Cantonese, but I could understand a little bit, saying, why do they send us a Japanese? Now this is, this is an indication of the variety, the diversity of the AAPI community. And I cocked my ears. I, at that time, I did not know that it had been a prisoner of war camp or whatever for the Japanese. And so I got up on stage, they introduced me, even though my name is Chang, they should know that Zhang, that they, they should know that I'm Chinese, but they didn't, they thought I was Japanese. Most people, by the way, think I'm Japanese. I got up on stage, I said a few words in English, then I said a few words in Mandarin. And then all of a sudden, I got their attention. And they said, oh, she's Chinese. That's good. That ended that episode, all right. Now, going on to Nepal where I was ambassador, I have two things to, to tell. When I first arrived, um, and I met the Chinese ambassador to Nepal. He looked at me and he said, ah, China now has two ambassadors. I said, there's a twist, however. I said, I am a Chinese American. And he just laughed and we became friends thereafter. Then on one of my trips into the, the Western regions where there were a lot of Peace Corps volunteers, and lots of very, very poor villages. I was welcomed very lavishly uh, by one village. And I heard this little girl saying to her father, you promised me that I could meet the American ambassador. I don't see him. And he said to her, he said, there she is. Oh no, she said, no, 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 no. She is not the American ambassador. Uh, she, she's Nepali. So I never had anybody say to me that we wanted an American and it's not you. But what I just told you is, is really an example of why AAPI representation in foreign affairs is important. Because we should look like America abroad in our embassies. And with our representation, we can show the world that we are in fact diverse and rich culturally. I think I've taken up enough time. Yeah, no, I'd love for Secretary Chow to kind of talk a little bit about representation matters. I was not aware of all the things that you had done 
um, at the Labor Department. And can you talk a little bit of those things probably would not have get done, got done, gotten done, I assume, if you were not uh, secretary. Can you talk a little bit about how all those things came about and, and the sort of what sort of challenges came about when you were asking people to, you know, translate different things into different languages or asking them to, you know, start collecting new data? Well, what happened, uh, what prompted these conferences that I was holding was that I know many of us have commented about the lack of uh, diversity in top management and even the federal government. There seems to be a bamboo ceiling and a lot of Asian Americans were not breaking into the executive suite. So I started the Asian American, uh, the Asian Pacific American Federal Advancement Forum in order to equip, train, uh, prepare Asian Americans to go into the senior ranks of the federal government as career SESs and also as heads of agencies. And then the second conference that we hosted was some annually, these are annual uh, conferences, was called the Opportunity Conference. I said to people that, um, you know, there's so many opportunities in federal procurement, but I can't give these grants to you directly. What I can do is to show you how the process works and give you a roadmap, and then you've got to make your own way. And uh, this Opportunity Conference was for um, communities of color, people who have traditionally been underserved in the federal government, in the federal procurement areas. And then thirdly, uh, Asian Americans as a population were never broken out as a separate category when in, in terms of the unemployment numbers. So in 2003, we finally broke out Asians and Asian American unemployment numbers uh, for the first time in history. And that's how we know that Asian Americans uh, have the lowest unemployment rate. And prior to the pandemic uh, in February of 2020, you know, usually the um, unemployment rate was about 2.4%. And then, you know, the federal government's really confusing. Most people want to comply, but they can't comply with the labor laws, which are very complicated, obtuse, and uh, you know they come in thick volumes, especially when it's not in their native, lung, uh, la native language, native tongue. So we started this process where we translated labor laws into a whole series of Asian, East Asian, South Asian languages so that people would understand what their obligations are, what the federal government requires them to do, you know, to protect the workforce. Absolutely. Uh, Congresswoman Meng, you, have you had any experiences where people are like, oh, you know, you're not a real American? Um, but then also, can you talk about your challenges as being an Asian American working in government? Um, and, and, and why representation matters as well. Um, you, a lot of the things that you have done, um, all the laws that you have helped pass aren't specific to you know, the Asian communities, but I'm assuming they, they touch those communities as well as others. So can you talk a little bit about, about that? Sure. Um, first, if I could take a point of personal privilege, uh, thank you, Mary, and thank you to uh, Glenn and everyone at MPCA for including me today. Uh, I am not a Peace Corps volunteer, but super honored to be here in all of your presence with Secretary Chow, Ambassador Block, um, and so many of the returning Peace Corps uh, volunteers, uh, especially wanted to give a shout out to those from my district here in Queens, New York, um, and also my former legislative director, Helen Bordreau, who was a twice returned uh, Peace Corps volunteer. So just wanted to show off my district and my connections a little bit, um, but incredibly grateful for all of your service to our country and literally representing America at every corner uh, of the globe. Um, you know, I was born and raised here. Um, I think that this past year and a half has been especially a wake up call um, for our community. Um, and I'm actually glad that we're not doing this in the month of May because a lot of people and organizations do AAPI Heritage Month events, 
But when May is over, it's like people forget about us. And so I'm really thankful that we have this opportunity to continue talking about and showing off our community together. Um, so this past you know, two years has been a bit painful, but I do think that in some ways our community has grown stronger because of this. We have learned to strengthen our voices of advocacy. We have learned to work with other communities. Um, and I think that a lot of the discrimination that we've talked about in recent months, it's not necessarily something new. Asian Americans have been discriminated against long um, before this last two years. Um, and starting with, you know, legislation that Congress passed, like the Chinese Exclusion Act to Japanese American citizens being uh, put in internment camps and, and the list goes on. We have just too often been viewed as outsiders or foreigners. Um, I think that we can all relate to experiences where even to this day, and I live in Queens, New York, one of the most diverse counties in the country, still have experiences where people are asking where I learned to speak English so well, or, you know, where am I really from? And we have all, we all have plenty of these types of stories to tell. Um, but that's why I think that, you know, making sure that the mainstream community, whether it's the media, whether it's Hollywood, in the halls of government, that we are being seen and heard and recognized um, is so important. Um, but yeah, we look, we all have similar stories that we can share. You know, I remember when I was elected to the state legislature. Um, some of us were watching the news and there were a bunch of, it was about like a group of people fighting or something. And my colleague turned to me and he said, well, Grace knows karate. I'm sure she can save us. And by the way, I don't know karate, <laughs> but you know, it's just constant comments like that. I think also what is most, what I focus on a lot, I think, and maybe not even intentionally when I had come to Congress was that we are often seen as invisible. Um, there are so many times where I'll be in a room, and this is bipartisan, unfortunately, where people will be talking about different communities, and they literally leave AAPIs out. It's like we are not even mentioned, acknowledged, or recognized. And so I feel that, you know, I, I joke with my staff, but I feel like sometimes I need to wear a pin and, you know, say, hey, and AAPIs too, don't forget us. Um, and so it is, it's something that's constant. And, you know, I didn't necessarily come to Congress just to represent the AAPI community, but I know for a fact, as I'm sure Secretary Chow and Ambassador Block knows, that there are many rooms and tables where we're sitting at that if we did not speak up for the AAPI community, I know for sure that no one else in that room would. Absolutely. And, and I do agree with you. Sometimes it's like the Asian AAPI community just left out of conversations. And I like to think that it's because in our history classes in school, we were never really taught about, it's kind of like Asian people like came and they built the railroads and then there were Japanese internment camps and like, that's it, you know? And we don't really talk about, I think I had seen a documentary recently about um, Asians coming to like Mississippi, like at the turn of the you know last century. And I was like, what? Like there's Asian people who were in Mississippi, like, you know, a hundred years ago, you know, and I just remember being so blown away and kind of angry that like, I hadn't known about this, you know, um, are, are there any things that you wish that, um, U S history classes taught about Asian Americans in the United States and their con contributions. And I'll throw that to all three of you. I want this to be a real casual conversation. So anyone can jump in on that question. Well, I think our world is now so diverse. Our country is so diverse. Our world is so diverse. And we're so uh, interconnected. You know, we have high school kids now who routinely go overseas. When I was growing up, you know, oh, as my husband would say, you know, foreign country was Tennessee. And so <laughs> it was so different. And yet, if you talk to so many young people these days in high school, they've been to France, they've been to Europe, they've been to Latin America. So the world is much closer now. And I think it's really important that we understand each other and experiences like, you know, the Peace Corps and where, again, Peace Corps volunteers are able to go abroad, but then come back and fulfill the third mission. 
which is to help Americans understand the rest of the world. It's a very important part of this agency's purpose as well. Absolutely. Well, I was going to say that I think that we should defer to Representative Mun uh, because she has in introduced very important legislation to um, promote the teaching of Asian Pacific American history in schools. And I, because I believe that at the root of this anti-Asian hate is ignorance about the AAPI community. Um, it's a consequence, I think, as you noted, uh, Mary, um, of the exclusion, the erasure, and the invisibility of Asian Americans, I think, from K through 12, a school curricula. I mean, did, did you learn anything really about Asian Americans in school? I don't remember that I did. So I think we really need to increase education about the history of anti-Asian racism, as well as contributions of Asian American society. But Representative uh, Men, you, sh you should talk about your legislation. Has it been uh, passed and signed into law like your other great uh, uh, bill on, on COVID-19? I mean, we need that into, into law, but how do we deal with the fact that education is local in the United States? Yeah, I agree with the ambassador. We do need to talk about both our accomplishments and the pain that our communities have faced in this country. A lot of what helps me initiate or think of um, different uh, legislation is the idea of equity. Mm -hmm. When I realize that other communities are, are benefiting or acknowledged in a way, but, but we aren't. My first legislation ever when I was back in the state legislature was to work on getting Lunar New Year and Eid to be um, school, public school holidays here in New York City. And that really stemmed from you know, my, my elementary school cries for justice when uh, my Jewish friends, when we all got off of Rosh Hashanah, which don't get me wrong, I was thrilled to have two days off of Rosh Hashanah, um, <laughs> but I had to go to school on Lunar New Year. And I just thought that was incredibly unfair in a city like New York. So anyway, that ultimately happened through um, our mayor. Um, but what, what, what we've seen is that I think maybe there was a paragraph or two about um, pieces of uh, how Asian Americans fit into our American mm -hmm. history, um, but there really wasn't that much. Um, and so a lot of the history that I've learned was as an adult or maybe as you know a college student taking electives, um, but there's so much history I want one of my goals, you know, and this is aside from being a Congress member, is to ensure that Asian American students recognize and understand in ways that I didn't even, that they are just as American as anyone else, that our stories, our experiences, I used to be kind of embarrassed about you know, my parents working in a restaurant or why my parents didn't dress like the other parents in my class. I was embarrassed about that. But, you know, now as an adult in my 40s, I now appreciate that, hey, our stories are just as American as anyone else. And so we are working on this legislation to provide more ways for our curriculum across the country um, to include AAPI history. Some states have already done it. Illinois was amongst, I think, the first. Connecticut mm -hmm. and New York have bills pending, um, but we're working on that. And in the long, long term, we are working on an APA museum uh, in Washington, D.C., too. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. I had not heard that. Is there, for the, this is for the three of you too, is there any specific Asian American Pacific Islander in history that you, that you, a story that maybe some of us might not have heard or a little anecdote or from history that you want to throw out there? I'm, I'm curious too. I'm, I'm, I'm always trying to learn. <laughs> well, did you see the uh, WITA's uh, Asian American series? I did not know this, but <clears throat> in, in that series, they covered all aspects of Asian Americans. But I had not known that, uh, let me see here. Um, in 19, from 1965 to 1970, did you know the Filipino workers led the Delano grape strike, which led to the creation 
of the United Farm Workers Union and better contracts. I mean, I did not know this. I did not know this until I was adult. I was probably out of college and yeah, a grown adult. I wrote this down so that I, I, I you know, I can remember the names exactly. Yeah. I think things like that. I mean, Asian Americans have participated in every aspect of American life Absolutely. and made contributions, you know, in the arts, in entertainment, in design, in journalism, uh, and of course, not to mention science. And so, you know, why are we not known for, for all those things? Right. We're not just laundry workers and restaurant owners. Absolutely. And, and also the Asian community, a API community is, is really complex and diverse in and of itself. I mean, Pew Research Center, oh, they had this great statistic. It said, they said 22 million Asian Americans traced their roots to more than 20 countries in the East, in East and Southeast Asia, and in the Indian subcontinent. And, and each of those places have their own unique histories and cultures and language, languages and characteristics. I mean, is it possible to like bring all those groups together or, you know, what, how can we be more inclusive as an AAPI community? Does anybody want to chime in with that? I'll let Secretary uh, Chow, I saw you turn your microphone on. Did you want to chime in on that? Uh, sure. Um, I was thinking, you know, about that. I think we are also discovering as a community, our own, our own voice, uh, because I think prior to in the 1960s, the Asian American groups were very disparate and they very seldom got together. It was only with the 60s onward that we began to understand that there were similarities. We came from similar parts of the globe and that coming together, we can amplify our voices for the benefit, not only of our communities, but for America as well. So we are on this path, this journey. And as Congresswoman Men mentioned, 2020 was a very sobering year. But uh, like she said, hopefully we have gained strength. More of mainstream America have noticed and understood what it means for to be an you know, uh, Asian American. And we're educating mainstream America about what our community is like. Absolutely, and I think as a community, we're also learning about each other. Yes. Did anybody else wanna chime in on how diverse the AAPI community is and what that means and, and what sort of challenges does that also present? Ambassador Block? I think it's a part of this program where uh, it was noted that uh, um, the AAPI community uh, comprises over 20 ethnicities. Um, but because of the model minority stereotypes, I think many or most Americans don't believe Asian Americans have suffered or suffer racism and discrimination. Um, I think there's a general perception, for example, that Asian Americans have high incomes, even higher than whites. But if you look at the statistics closely, the Hmong particularly and Cambodians and some uh, several other Southeast Asian countries uh, have not countries, but um, South Asian Americans have higher poverty rates than the national average. I looked that up too. Yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't know it off the top of my head. <laughs> right. so, so I think, I think that Fighting anti-Asian hate can help bridge these racial divides because I think these stereotypes have pitted Asian Americans against other minorities, dividing us from identifying with one another's problems. And the violence that AAPIs face increasingly is something I think shared by other minority groups. So as Asian Americans have become more targeted during the pandemic, I think we can use this period under some leadership to break down our own prejudices of other minorities and try to build solidarity and work together. So I, I, I see 
efforts to really work against anti-Asian hate as an opportunity for us to, to, in a way, find common ground and solidarity with other minority groups. Absolutely. Like if we're a friend and allies to other groups, they're going to be friends and allies for us. And we help each other. We're not, we shouldn't be pitted against each other. Congresswoman, you, you took yourself off mute. Yeah, I do think that this is one of the, um, the positive parts that have come out of this last year and a half. You know, when a lot of the incidents were starting to rise, um, a lot of our uh, community leaders in, for example, the Jewish and the Black community reached out to leaders in our community and tried to, you know, they showed solidarity, they tried to give advice. The legislation that we passed, you know, bipartisan legislation, um, it was largely also supported by people beyond the AAPI community. And I do agree with the ambassador, this has been a really a, a wake up moment in many ways for our community. Um, it's important to talk about uh, to address the racism that's hurled at our community, but also about some of the intolerance that may exist within our own communities, whether that's with other, amongst other AAPI groups or with other uh, communities um, as well. And I think that one thing that we can continue to do is to intentionally find opportunities for our shared communities to work together, to get to know each other. I remember in the early days, we had a Zoom in New York City with Black and uh, Asian leaders. And a lot of the stories that were shared were so obvious to maybe me and you. But, you know, we had the two different communities come together and they would say things like, well, you know, Asians suffer from poverty. You know, like there, there was a lot of uh, we just haven't done a good job, even in a diverse place like New York, where I live at, at sharing our stories and sharing our hurt um, and realize that we have so much more in common than we have different from each other. We had a rally, a Stop Asian Hate rally in Flushing, Queens, and we had, you know, leaders from like the NAACP, uh, our Jewish leaders, uh, Reverend Sharpton came to Flushing, right? This is an example of community leaders standing together and saying that discrimination against anyone uh, is not okay. So I do think that this is something that sometimes is a little hard for our parents or our grandparents' generation. They don't necessarily have the tools and the language to be able to help bridge these communities. They were too worried about survival for all of our sakes. But, um, you know, I, I do think that one thing that we need to do is to keep finding ways, opportunities and events like this to be able to talk about this and to bridge that, that divide. Absolutely. I'm glad you guys both brought up this issue of you know, people think like, oh, Asian people are totally fine. They're doing well. You know, they're usually like upper middle class. But in fact, the data shows that there's an increasingly widening gap between the wealthiest Asian Americans and the poorest Asian Americans, like the poorest of all our community are becoming even more poor. And so that is something we definitely have to work to try to alleviate for sure. And I have a question. No. I think Secretary <laughs> Chow has done a great deal. Um, when she was, you know, labor secretary, and also I think when she was at transportation, uh, she cares about uh, the AAPI community. I wonder about data collection <clears throat> because uh, we're categorized, you know, all of us as AAPI. Well, you know, we're all lumped together, and data, I, I believe, is collected generally that way at the national, state, and local levels. Is there some way to? Uh, you know, disaggregate this data collection and recognize the differences and not lump the AAPI community together. I mean, uh, there must be some way. I mean, because we are in the age of technology. It seems to me it, it, it should be done. It can't be done. But I, I certainly don't have the answers. Secretary Chow, I think uh, Ambassador Black. <laughs> has supposed a question for you? I think it's a very good question. Uh, data is empowering. We can't administer government programs without understanding where they go, who receives them, how much resources are devoted to what groups. So I think the data collection is very important. 
uh, two, I think, uh, obstacles uh, stand in the way. One is just resources. And unless there is pre-planning, prescient, um, thinking about you know, how to do this in a sy systemic, long-term fashion, getting the resources is difficult because these are very expensive undertakings. And then um, number two, I think um, there's sometimes political resistance uh, against it as well. But I agree with the ambassador. I think we learn more about ourselves and how do we disaggregate all these uh, you know, different Asian American groups. And, they're, and actually Pew Charitable Trust in 2012 did an excellent job. It was a seminal study. It was the first time that any major uh, demographic study had been done on the Asian American population in the United States. But we're coming up on 10 years. And certainly that effort needs to be uh, revisited and redone because a lot has happened in the last 10 years. So there are private sector efforts and also government uh, propelled efforts. But clearly uh, getting more data, I think is helpful. That's a really good point. We don't know what the problem is until we collect data, but collecting data takes a lot of work and resources and you have to figure out how to do it in, in the best way, right? So the data tells the actual story, absolutely. Thank you, Ambassador Block. <laughs> for, and if anybody else has any questions of each other, I want this to be very organic. So um, one thing I want to talk about is, um, so the, the API community does have its challenges, but women in particular, Asian American Pacific Islander women, um, there's certain stereotypes that exist, meek, demure. Can you talk a little bit about that um, and, and what challenges, unique challenges that women have in this community? Let's jump Any, in here. Yes, go ahead. Out, I wanna give a big shout out to the ambassador because Ambassador Julia Chang Block and another woman leader by the name of Pauline Sui started the Organization of Chinese American Women. And this was really seminal. I remember coming to Washington, you know, as a young pup and seeing this group <laughs> of fantastic, empowering, women, it was so inspiring to be with them. And they, um, you know, they, they blazed so many trails. Uh, they gave voice to Asian American women that we were not subservient to the men and that there were some pretty amazing, there was, there were amazing, you know, empowering, inspiring women. Um, number two, I would say, I come from a family of six daughters and I want to really credit my parents. They were so progressive and so empowering of their daughters. From a very early age, you know, they told us that if you work hard, you can do whatever you want to, uh, to do, uh, you know, that you can dream all sorts of dreams. So I think we've got to offer more inspiration to young women, older women, you know, mm -hmm. making changes. But we have to be more, we, we, we need to be more supportive and uh, I think more and challenge more the women. Challenge is not the right word, you know, but to encourage people to seek their dreams. And I think we're, we've come a long way, but there's still a long ways to go. Well, Elaine, thank you so very much. But now you have become the leader of us. Oh, really? I don't know about that. We've got <laughs> Congresswoman Monday. But, you, but Elaine person. mentioned Pauline Tsui. She has uh, unfortunately passed away. But in her memory, um, she uh, had a little foundation and the foundation uh, supported, gave us support to um, establish a series on Asian women uh, trailblazers. And our first uh, inaugural program featured Secretary Chow and Representative Judy Chu, because it was about government and service. And our next one is going to be focused on higher education. I've gotten, I found three female Asian women present, one Japanese American, one Korean American, one Chinese American. So you'll hear about that program. Our third one will be on journalists, on journalism. We're still putting that program together. But what we wanted to do was to give voice and visibility to Asian women to hopefully inspire the next generation that yes, you can, you can. I love but that. 
I want to, I want to, however, leave you with uh, this thought. Uh, It was the Page Act of uh, 1885. It barred Asian women from China, Japan, and all other Asian countries from entering the United States. Why? Because the thought was that Asian women brought prostitution. The stereotyping of Asian women has been insidious and harmful barriers to are achieving any position of authority and leadership. Just think about that. Asian women were considered to be equivalent to prostitution. And that's, I think, what led to also these horrible stereotypes that have exotified and sexualized Asian women. I mean, just think about the women who were killed in Atlanta. So I really do think that we need to consider that Asian women, we suffer double jeopardy. We're not just discriminated against by one society. We suffer the the, uh, stereotyping of our Asian heritage as well as American society. It's a double bank. And so I congratulate all of us on this panel that we somehow survived and we should share how we survived, how we succeeded, because I think the next generation still needs it. Absolutely. I have to say, growing up in the 80s, every time I would see um, Connie Chung on TV, I would get yes. so excited. And she really is one of the reasons why I pursued a career in journalism. I mean, it was really, it was so, it was really, it was really um, exciting to see her on TV. Um, but yeah, and also I have to say, and Congresswoman, I want you to jump in on this conversation as well, but I have to say, in my 25 years of working, I've never had, you know, an Asian American or an Asian American woman as a boss. And that's really disheartening for me because I don't see these women in leadership positions and circles, you know, that I have. But on the flip side, I don't know any Asian American women who are meek and demure, (laughs) quite the contrary. So I don't know what the stereotype is all about, but Congresswoman, do you want to chime in? Sure, I think that all of you touched upon the concept of mentorship and seeing AAPI women in leadership roles, regardless of what field you're in. And I think that is so important. I think for so many of us, um, you know, we have tried or I have tried too long in my lifetime to try to be or sound like a man, right? Um, Especially when I was running for office, I remember when my first major debate, I was terrified my opponent was this huge, you know, former fireman, former cop. I mean, I could not get more intimidating and my voice is not that loud to begin with, Asian or not. Um, And then the night before I saw a debate between two of our US Senator candidates in New York Um, both were women, Uh, one Republican woman, one Democrat woman, and just watching them, that they could sound and be beautiful leaders as women really inspired and encouraged me and gave me so much strength for for my debate the next day. Um, And so I think that concept of mentorship, right? We have so much to offer. You don't have to be wealthy. You don't have to have a fancy title to be a mentor to someone, right? Um, You know, I speak to students all the time. And, you know, I think that something that uh, encourages them is not my title. It's not my, you know, list of accomplishments. It's the fact when I tell them that when I was a kid growing up, I was so shy and so timid. And that advice, which can come from anyone, they, a lot of them resonate with that and they realize that they too can be leaders. And, you know, that's something that I think uh, is really important, but, you know, to, 
to the tragedy that happened in Atlanta, I think in many ways that broke so many of us. You know, the automatic assumption, for example, that in the beginning, oh, you know, they were sex workers, right? Like there were all these, you know, fake news or, you know, stereotypes that were being circulated. I actually had the opportunity with some of my colleagues to go to Atlanta and to meet some of the victims' families and to hear their stories. And that's what really gave me, myself, a wake-up call. I think I talked about my own upbringing for the first time in my life about, you know, I remember a story where you know, my parents who worked in a restaurant came to school and they were dressed like they worked in a restaurant. <laughs> and I was too embarrassed to say hello to them, right? And being, being in Atlanta, talking to those families made me realize, like, gosh, the sacrifices that Asian American women at all levels have faced uh, and, you know, have sacrificed so that we could have the opportunity to be educated here, to get jobs here, to serve our country. Um, that's something that is so patriotic and so American. And I think, you know, I'm trying um, in my limited capacity to talk about that more. Um, and that, you know, again, our stories are, are just American, as American as, as anyone else. And that intersection of racism and misogyny that has existed for way too long, um, that is something that we need to continue to, to combat. Absolutely. Does anybody else want to chime in on this? I guess I would like to add a little bit more to the demure and passive, or no, it was meek and demure. You said you don't know anybody like that. I, however, do, do know from my generation, and there are many. <laughs> and they were never able to... Uh, get beyond the their positions in, in, in the technical areas um, because they didn't want to stand out. I mean, they, they, maybe they were shy or afraid to stand out. But to add to the meek and demure, we've already talked about the, um, the, the, the sexualized, the exotified, and I would add objectified stereotype. The Susie Wongs and the uh, Madame Butterflies even I mean, the whole idea, I think, really stemmed from uh, from the uh, Page Act of 1885, and that somehow or other, uh, Asian women can be considered uh, sex objects to be exploited, but not good enough to be wives. However, the let's say those of us here today, I think we would fall into another category. Have you heard of the Dragon Lady? Stereotype, any Asian woman of any authority is classified as a dragon lady. But the dragon lady, if you look at its history, it is a derogatory uh, stereotype. It is not positive. Women who are powerful, but also deceitful and manipulating and cruel I mean, that's all. So I also I also have read also uh, sexually alluring. They were all added together. These are these are the the, the fuller uh, picture of that stereotype. But today it's it's a people who with Asian women who are who are um, authoritative and powerful. But how do you how do you deal with popular culture that has basically established, then multiplied that stereotype so that it's now part of really part of the canon about Asian, Asian American women. Absolutely, which is why it's so important, I think, for representation, right? Like Asian women need to be seen in different positions. Right now on Netflix, I just started watching The Chair, which features Sandra Oh. Who, who becomes like the first chair of the English department at this like stodgy old university. And I was like, oh, okay, you know, the chair of the English department, right? All right, I get that. So, but yeah, definitely. Thank you, thank you so much for that. Um, I'm gonna segue probably to our last question. We've got about, I think 10 more minutes left. Um, you know, some of you, I think Congresswoman, you talked about growing up and being embarrassed of your, your parents who worked in a restaurant. Um, I was 
sort of embarrassed of my mom's really thick Filipino accent. She was really embarrassed of it too. I was embarrassed of all the the food she would send me to school with, rice and mung beans, you know, and egg rolls and people being like, whoa, what is that? You know, and the fish sauce. I don't know why she thought sending me to school with fish sauce for lunch was a good idea. But <laughs> but but could you talk a little bit and, um, you know, how the, your, your self-identity has evolved and, and how you view yourself and your family and, um, you know, was there embarrassment in the beginning in your youth and, and how have you kind of evolved through there? Does anyone, a, Congresswoman, I see you took your, go ahead. Sure. I mean, I think I could be a case study. There was not a more shy kid than myself. And I don't even know if it's related to being Asian, but I was super shy. Um, and there weren't a lot of Asians around me either. And so, you know, dealing with, with both of that, uh, I was the type that would maybe tremble if a teacher called on me, I would try to disappear into the walls if I could, when I meet people who knew me in high school and before that, you know, they can't even fake it. They're like, I cannot believe you're in politics. I, it just doesn't seem fitting for your personality at all. But I think that what gave me strength was sort of um, getting involved in the community, seeing that I, as a high school, college, law school student, uh, even at that beginning level, could help people around me. You know, one of the things I did after law school was I started a nonprofit with some of my friends. And we literally just, you know, had senior citizens come in, they would bring in their mail once a week, and we would help help them read it, you know, it wasn't rocket science at all. But we felt that we were doing a community uh, service and doing doing some good. And so I, I say that I tell that story a lot to young people, because you absolutely do not need to have a fancy title or role to be able to improve the lives directly of the people uh, around you. And so I think that as I was reaching out, I indirectly benefited from that because that gave me strength. Those people um, who I was trying to help, actually I saw and witnessed how strong they were and I became stronger myself and realized that it was my duty, my responsibility as a daughter of immigrants to give back to this country and to give back to this community. Um, and so that's why I believe representation in all sectors beyond government uh, is so important. We have to have people who look like us, who can relate to our stories. Um, and that's that's helped me personally. So. If I could kind of bring that a little bit, when you were saying you're working in your community, did that help you kind of understand your parents' journey and help you sort of, you know, have a better appreciation of them and maybe not be as embarrassed or, or you know, just your understanding of them, you know, seeing other people similar to them, understanding. Yeah. Like, I mean, growing up, you know, you're the only Asian, you're shy, you know, you're the only one bringing dumplings to school. I mean, come on, right? And it's like, you, you think you're the only one who is suffering in this way in the universe. And then you meet people, you're in more diverse settings, and you realize life is much bigger than that. Um, and what makes us different and what makes us feel weird as kids is actually something that I really appreciate. You know, and I'm so thankful for these experiences now. I'm thankful for my parents' sacrifices. And in turn, I try to use those experiences um, to encourage those who are younger than me or who, who come after me. Um, and so that's why I think, you know, appreciating and using our own experiences and stories uh, is so important. And again, looped back into the history of this country, you know, why aren't dumplings are just as American as, as any other American food, right? Um, actually, kids these days now, they're, these kids know so much. They're so diverse. I have non-Asian kids asking for dumplings and other Asian types of food all the time. <laughs> yeah, definitely. We're all, yeah, there's so much more social media and people are just knowing interconnectivity. So, but then, you know, we also get into the question of appropriation, which is probably another question, but let, let's stick to the question of self-identity and kind of growing up and evolving. And um, Secretary Ambassador, do you want to jump in and 
uh, talk a little bit about your kind of self-identity through the years and, and how that sort of evolved? Oh, sure. I, I think that at some point in most Asian American young people's lives, you, you ask yourself whether you are Chinese or American. I mean, in our case, and in your case, whether you're Filipina or American. I asked myself that question one year after I arrived in San Francisco from China. I was 10. I entered myself in a forensic contest. And to sp speak on being a marginalized citizen. I won the contest, but I didn't have the answer. But I found it was easy to speak Chinese. Oh, not to speak Chinese. Less easy not to think or behave like a Chinese or dress like a Chinese. And impossible not to, not to be seen as Chinese, to, be, to look Chinese. At university, I, I found um, Chinese student associations I thought would be my answer to my identity. But I did not find myself fitting into the uh, American born Chinese groups, ABCs, or those fresh off the boat, FOBs. Because in those days, they were divided between Hong Kong and Taiwan groups. And increasingly, my, my circle of friends became predominantly white. I perceived the powerlessness of the Chinese in America. And that prompted me to want to become an American. I realized that only mainstreaming uh, would make me be able to make a difference in America. After graduation, I joined the Peace Corps to pursue my roots and to make a difference in the world. But teaching English at a Chinese middle school gave me the opportunity to find out once and for all whether I was Chinese or American. I think you know the answer. It's too long to tell you the details. But traveling and immersing myself in the Chinese diaspora communities across Asia, I found deep kinship with the love of family, of course, the love of food, cooking, and eating. But I just could not live with the acceptance of life in that part of the world, life that is preordained, um, that you could not control your own life or have the freedom of choice as an individual. And finally, in a classroom, a student opened my eyes to an interesting truth. I could be a Chinese man, but not a Chinese woman in Asia. That story is too long to tell. So I will just briefly go over the other milestones in my journey to really find myself. Graduate school at Harvard made me more a citizen of the world, rooted in the West, but able to live, think, work, and compete like an American, but connected by ethnicity, which, by the way, defines our identity to Asians around the world. My ambassadorship made me a Chinese-American who straddles the East and the West. And being having been a Peace Corps volunteer, I have always believed that it was my obligation that to bring China home to America and vice versa. And that's what I've been doing with the US-China Education Trust since 1998. 
I love that story, actually. You know, I, I hope I, I didn't take too long. No, no, it's perfect. Actually, I'm glad you mentioned that. You know, I mean, I was thinking about when I first left for the Philippines and I had not requested to go to the Philippines. They just needed people, you know, with my skill set, you know, and they were leaving at the time I needed to. And I was like, OK, I'm going to do this. And my family was like, oh, my God, like, why are you here? Are you in trouble? Did you get in trouble? Like, why do you have to live in this like little village in the middle of nowhere? And but I kept telling all the other volunteers, like, I don't know anything about the Philippines. Like, I'm American, you know. And I got there and I was like, oh, wait, no, I, I am Filipino. Like, I get all of this, you know, and I didn't realize, you know, and so I think that was definitely an evolution. Secretary Chow, do you want to chime in? I think so much has been said and it's really, um, it's really very touching as I listen to everybody. And I think um, I'm obviously of uh, an older generation and I think there's been a lot of migration in how we see ourselves. When I first came to America at the age of eight, America was not very diverse. Asian Americans were less than 1% of the national population. And I felt that I was the one constantly making compromises to accommodate myself to mainstream America. You know, fast forward 45 years later, we are now 72%, uh, point, sorry, 7.2% of the national population. America is so much more diverse. And there's a much greater an, uh, appetite and uh, eagerness to learn about different people's backgrounds. So I think for people living now, you know, there are so many more people interested in our culture, whereas 40 years ago, that was just not the case. And so I think America is changing. We are seeing a greater, again, diversity within our own ranks, greater globalization, uh, greater awareness of the world outside. And that's making the Asian American experience in America, I think a more a, a better one, a more easy to share our experiences, culture, philosophy, food uh, with uh, mainstream America. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you for those comments. We, we've just got a few more minutes. Does anybody want to have Let's any- hear from Congresswoman then. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have any final words? Does anybody want to chime in in our in our closing minutes? Um, I feel like I've I've said so much and, and just incredibly grateful to be here in the presence of the secretary and the ambassador and, and all of you wonderful patriotic uh, volunteers who represent our country so well around the world. Um, I am just one person here in New York City, but, you know, don't hesitate to reach out to me as well. I think it's so important that we strengthen our network of AAPI leaders and community members across this country. That's one thing that I've learned um, throughout this past year or so, especially during COVID, where it's actually been a little easier to, to network and to meet Asian American leaders from other parts of the country, but that's something that I think we need to do better as a community. Uh, it will help us help each other um, to be more visible and to be more effective advocates uh, for our community as well. So thank you very much for this opportunity and I look forward to continuing to hear great things about the Peace Corps. And thank you, Glenn. And also thank you, Mary. Great job, Mary. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I want to thank MPCA also for uh, this opportunity to, to feature the voice, voices of Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders, and to talk about the issues and talk about the importance of raising the visibility of this community and how representation just matters. And so um, thank you, Secretary Chow, Ambassador Black. Uh, I have, I, can I have one more word? Yes, please. I think we should also say representation is, is it matters, but Peace Corps matters too. And this is Peace Corps' 60th anniversary. I, I think that we should uh, uh, remember that Peace Corps is still alive. I believe Peace Corps volunteers are returning to the field, right? So I give a shout out to everybody in the audience who are young enough. Oh, no, no, Peace Corps volunteers can be young and middle-aged and old. Everybody is welcome. So join the Peace Corps. It's what is the saying? Is the best job you've ha ever had? The hardest job, I think. Isn't it the, the hardest, hardest job? The toughest I think job. The it, toughest job. Join, join the Peace Corps. You won't regret it. You won't regret it. Well, I think you're preaching to the audience. I think there's a lot of RPCVs here and Peace Corps supporters. 
Thank you so much. Um, I think the, the organizers are going to do something now. They told me to stop talking at 8.05 Central Time. So again, thank you. This was an immense, immense honor. I thank you so much for, uh, for chatting with me. Thank you.